Hello, everyone. I uh, hope you're uh, having a good night at the sailing school. Uh, my name is Drew Mitchell. I'm um, I'm a coach at North U, and that's how I kind of got connected with you guys, as well as I uh, run the North Sales Vancouver Loft in Vancouver, Canada. Um, I was lucky enough to meet Jamie, Molly, Megan, and Lisa this winter, and I was their coach uh, down at a St. Thomas Performance Race Week. And we'll chat a little bit about that later, maybe sneak in a video or two I talk. Um, but we're going to go through sale trim and I'm going to touch on sale care. Um, so I was actually, I think I was in that room about a couple of weeks ago at the Annapolis, uh, Helly Hansen sailing world regatta. We had a North U event there and we actually, you guys were nice enough to invite us over, um, to check out your sailing school. I was actually lucky enough to run aground just outside, just off, uh, your, um, your wharf there, it gets quite shallow. So just FYI, you want to stay within the green markers. I learned that out pretty quick on the first day. Um, but yeah, so I appreciate everyone coming today and we'll kind of fire through this. Um, I've got some information on sale care, then some stuff on the North U clinics because I know Jamie, Molly, Megan, and Lisa went last year. Um, we also had uh, a couple gentlemen in the um, North U event in um, Annapolis just recently. And we're planning to do more and more of these. and. Um, they're a great way to get out of your community, uh, get on a boat with a professional and, and have a fun week of sailing. So um, so we have fired up here. Uh, so my name's Drew Mitchell. As I said, I'm the tonight's presenter. Um, so today we're going to be going through quite, um, quite a bit of information on like sail controls. And I'm going to go through upwind um, trimming techniques with your mainsail, with your jib, and then downwind trimming techniques with your spinnakers, um, both asymmetrical and symmetrical. And there's gonna be some terminology. So as you probably all know, sailing has a completely different language and um, there's no dictionary for it, unfortunately. Um, but if you fly around the internet long enough, you can actually find like little images like this that kind of break down um, what different parts of the sail and different parts of the sailboat are called. And that's always pretty important because uh, I'm gonna be going through that. So the the main sail controls that I use on a main sail um, would be a boomfang, a Cunningham, an outhaul, and a backstay. Um, and these sail controls, I'm just going to chat about, um, just explain what they do quickly, and then we'll go into the actual sail trim and how you would use them. Um, so the boomfang, you can see it down at the bottom right. It's it's connected from the boom uh, to usually to the base of the mast, and that vang allows vertical adjustment of the boom. And it is an extremely important tool to shape the main for speed. Tension the vang, if you think about it, when you pull the boom down and you pull on the boom vang, it's tensioning the leech, which is the back edge of the sail. So that's, that's important to know. So boom vang tensions the back edge of the sail. Cunningham. So you can see over on the right-hand side, it says Cunningham crinkle. And it kind of points to a little crinkle. So you'd usually get some sort of system to be able to hook into that and pull down to help tension the front edge of the sail. So the Cunningham tightens or loosens the left of the sail and controls the fore and aft position of the draft of the mainsail. Okay, so we'll, we'll chat about what the draft is here shortly, but basically it tensions the front edge. It's like a halyard, but a lot of the time, it's much easier to make smaller adjustments with the Cunningham. So the halyard would do the same thing. If you pull your halyard up, the front edge of the sail would be tight. Uh, the Cunningham, you can make smaller adjustments without, without as much load. Uh, the out hall. Uh, so the out hall is on the far, I think, left. So at the end of the boom, you can see out hall. Um, it is a line that attaches from the back corner of your sail uh, into the boom. And basically this line can ease or tension the bottom of your sail, which is called the foot. So that is the out hall. And I know most of you guys all know this. I just kind of want to go over it just to, just to make sure. Um, and then the last control we have is a, is a back stake. And there's no real backstay in this image. It's, you can kind of see a topping lift there and that runs to the back of the boom. But a backstay is a sail control that attaches to the top of your mast, okay? And then usually attaches somewhere around your stern. Uh, sometimes one point, sometimes two point. And a lot of the time it is adjustable. So uh, the definition of a backstay is a backstay is a piece of standing rigging. So it's usually wire or sometimes you're using Dyneema now or something very low stretch that runs from the mast to either its transom or rear quarter, counteracting the forestay and jib. It is an important sail for 
It is important sail trim control and has a direct effect on the shape of the mainsail and the headsail. So it basically pulls the tip of the mast back. Um, so those are the four sail controls we're going to be talking about today quite uh, quite a bit. And um, the one thing we I just chatted about is what is the draft? So quick, easy answer is basically the deepest part of the sail. Okay. Uh, wherever the deepest part of the sail, if you were to look up the sail and the, 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 the draft is where the sail is the fattest, the, the, the biggest belly part of the sail. Um, you can look at that image there. So the cord length on a, on a mainsail, the bottom of the mainsail would be like your boom length. We always measure percentage of distance along the cord length. So the distance of the sail from the luff to the leech. Um, so say 50% would be right in the middle. Um, this kind of image here kind of might look like a head sale around 30, 35%. Um, so when we're talking about percentage, it's just percentage of the way from the loft to the leech of the sale. So um, that should be pretty, pretty clear. So main sail trim. So I'm going to go through light air, medium air, and heavy air because it definitely changes. Um, I don't think the rainbows have a traveler, if I remember, but I did want to go through it because I know maybe the tartan has one. And I'm sure people get out on other boats. So it's all good information. And, you know, if you don't use a traveler, you just use your main sheet. Um, but having a traveler is pretty nice. Um, a traveler is something that allows the main sheet basically to go uh, to windward or leeward. And that helps change the shape of the mainsail and in terms of twist profile. Um, if you didn't have uh, a traveler, you would, you would basically just need to ease the main sheet to get a little bit more twist and pull it on if you wanted the the um the leech a little tighter so the first thing we want to talk about is on a mainsail you want your draft roughly 45 to 50 percent aft of your of your luff okay so you're in the middle of the sail you roughly want your draft in the middle of the sail a nice new sail that draft's probably going to be in the right spot if you have some older dacron sails that have been used quite a bit the draft might start creeping a little further aft and what you could do with that is just add a little cunningham or a little extra halyard when you're going out to kind of offset that belly that's sneaking to the aft side of the sail um so when you're setting up a mainsail you want your top telltale flying at least 50 percent of the time so once you're set up and you're sailing and this is we're sailing upwind so we're sailing in a close hold course you pull your main sheet in and you look at that top telltale and there should be like a red ribbon off the back of your top batten and if you pull your main sheet really far in that batten will start pointing towards you and that 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 ribbon will start to hide around the back side of the mainsail. And what that is, is basically it's telling you that there's not continuous flow on the back side of the mainsail. So it's stalling. And you want the sail to have that top telltale stalling 50% of the time. And, and how you do that is, is if <clears throat> is to open or close your leech. And then that's usually done with a bit of traveler as well as main sheet tension. And um, the more you pull your main sheet on, the closer the leech is going to be, the easier the more you ease it, the more open your leech is going to be. And with a high aspect sail, like a mainsail, little adjustments is quite a bit. Um, so in terms of sail control, so the first thing I would do in light air, I would have my traveler all the way to weather, just like in this picture. You can see the travelers up between uh, the gentleman or lady's legs. Uh, then I would ease my main sheet to about midship so that the, that the boom is roughly at where the backstay would be, so right in the middle of the boat. And that would give your sail nice, nice twist to it. And you would look up at your telltale and you would see if that telltale is breaking or if it's flying all the time. If it's flying all the time, you're going to want to add a little bit more tension. And if it's if it's stalled all the time, you're going to want to ease, ease a little bit to open up the twist. Um, so in terms of sail controls, uh, it's pretty light air. So you, in, in theory, other than for the one incidence I talked about before, we have a bit of an older sail. You probably want your cutting. Good question. Yep, of course. Andrew, so the 50%, is that all points of sale or beating to windward on a close haul? Uh, that would be the close, uh, 50%, yeah, all, all points of sale. That would be all points of sale, uh, for sure. Um, sorry, I just got out of my slideshow there. So that would be 50, you would want your mainsail draft roughly at 50% on all points of sale, if you're going upwind or downwind. But it's a, it's it, in on a mainsail, uh, when you're going upwind, it's much more loaded. So you would be, especially as you start getting into heavier, you start actually adjusting sail controls to move that draft back forward. Um, so that, that's kind of why I have it here. But at any point of sail, you would want in lighter airs, you wouldn't want your draft much further aft or too much further forward than 50%.
Um, your boom vang, all your tension for the sh for your leech is going to be done in the light air by your main sheet. So you want your boom vang off so you don't have too much tension on your leech and you and you don't have a closed off leech. Out haul, you want to make the foot of the sail relatively flat. And the reason for that is a lot of the time in light air, people think they want fuller sails to get going. But the way that the wind works is the wind goes around the front edge of the sail as well as the back edge of the sail. When it runs around the back of the edge of the sail, it actually speeds up and then it continues and it connects off the back edge of the sail. So when it's going along the back, if it has too much shape in the sail, the, the light air won't be able to get around like the, the big draft or the big belly in the sail and it'll actually spin off and you're, and you're saying that the wind won't complete um, its, its, its travel length around the sail. So you, you don't want it too full. So you want the sail ra rather flat so the, sail, the air can get around it easily. Backstay, you don't need to start depowering. Backstay, pulling on backstay. And a lot of these sales controls is starting to depower sales and change, get the sails a little flatter. So you don't need any backstay on. And then traveler. So we kind of talked about how you add travel uh, twist. So big thing in light air is having twist. So you want to pull your um, traveler to windward. You want to ease your boom. So the boom is at midship or ease the main sheet. So the boom is at midship. You want to open up the top of the sail to help induce flow. So I always recommend, especially in light to variable conditions, which you do see in Annapolis and Vancouver, it's very similar conditions as you guys. It's light, kearny, you know, very tricky. I'd always recommend on, on leaning on the side of having a little bit more twist and less twist because more twist is a much more forgiving setting. And once you get the boat moving and really locked and loaded, you can take that twist out and really be on the edge. But when it's kind of light and variable, um, you know, don't be afraid to ease a little bit to just get the boat moving and get the flow on the on the sails as well and the flow on the foils going and you might be able to get the boat moving a little quicker. Um, so going into upwind, medium air. So you can see these are two J70s here going upwind. I would say this would be medium air. And, uh, you know, they're just at the point, you know, I would say at the, the lighter end of medium air, eight to 10 knots, you're still kind of powering the boat up. I would say when you're, 12 to 15, you're actually probably starting to power the boat down a little bit. So in light, medium air, you kind of have two settings uh, where you're still trying to get the boat moving as quickly as possible. And then and eventually I would say at 50 knots, you're, you're probably healing over quite a bit and trying to trying to flatten things out and, and depower. So draft in medium air, you're probably going to start moving that draft or you are going to start moving that draft slightly forward. We're talking 5%. So a lot of that is just adding a little bit of Cunningham just getting that sail a little bit flatter, which will move that draft forward. Um, at the lower end, I think you could get away with a hint of wrinkles, you know, in that eight to 10 knots. Uh, in that 12 to 15, you're probably starting to get, you know, get those wrinkles out. You can see on that J70, there's nice little wrinkles there. Sail looks relatively full on the mainsail. Now in the eight knots, you could probably snug your boom bang. Um, you know, that means just take any sort of um, excess line that's that's in it out. Um, out haul, now you're going to want to start powering up the sail. So the out haul eases the foot of the sail. You're going to want to ease that out haul. And you can see the boom in these, in these or the main sail foot in these images. It's not strapped right to the boom. So they've actually eased it a little bit. That helps power it up. Again, I would say at the upper end of medium air, you're probably starting to flatten that foot out. Uh, but don't be scared, especially in a little bit of sea state. And we'll chat about that in a little bit. You know, you, you can add a little bit, ease out haul, add some shape to the foot of your mainsail, and you're really going to power that boat up. Okay. And then, you know, you could start using backstay. You know, on a masthead rig, backstay early is usually pretty good, especially with the big Genoas um, on a rainbow or do four. I don't, I think the do or the uh, tartan, I think that's a fractional. I'm not sure if it has a backstay on it or not, but. You know, you'd probably, a fractional rig's not going to affect it as much with a masthead rig with the forestay going all the way to the tip of the mast. As soon as you start pulling the tip of the mast back, it really starts affecting the forestay, the forestay and the head sail shape. Um, so now, you know, in that lighter air setting, we had our traveler up and our main sheet off and we had a nice twist. As we start wanting to power the mainsail up, you're going to see that top telltale flying you know, very often, 100% of the time. So how to take that out is take the twist out of the mainsail. So you're going to start dropping your traveler down. When you drop your traveler down, what happens is the boom goes down past 
your center line. So now you're going to pull your main sheet back up to get it back on center line. So you stay on a nice close hold course. And that will take the twist out. And then again, you're kind of finding that fine balance between about 50% stall, 50% flying. And that kind of shows you're just on the edge of proper trim. Okay. And that, that kind of, you know, at the eight knots, you're probably a little bit travel up, main sheet a little bit off. At the 12 to 15, you're probably travel right in the middle, main sheet on hard, you know? So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's main sail trim and medium air. And then heavy air. Um, so you guys probably all been out in this. You can see, you know, these are, uh, these etchels, they're going upwind and, and probably, you know, 15 to 18 knots and, and decent chops. So things really changed on, you know, on the boat when the, when the wind picks up and you really need to, especially if you are using Dacron sails, which are, they're fairly stretchy relative to some of the more modern fibers that are being used in sail making. But a lot of the time it keeps the cost down, which is really effective. And, you know, this is a world-class uh, fleet in the etchels and they still use Dacron sails. So it's, it's not a bad thing. Sometimes you can just actually use your sail controls a little bit more efficiently on Dacron sails because they do have the ability to stretch a little more. Um, so draft now we're starting to, you know, either adjust our halyard or adjust our Cunningham and make sure that draft is moving a little bit further forward, okay? Sail controls, we're gonna pull our Cunningham on so there's no more wrinkles in the sail. We wanna make sure that sail is really flat and that will help move the draft forward and get, get that luff really, really tight. Boom vang, so you can actually start tensioning your boom vang and there's two things that the boom vang can do. It will actually start pushing into the lower section of your mast and start bending the lower section, which will help depower the boat. It will also give you opportunities to vang sheet, okay? Um, um, vang sheeting is basically instead of um, dropping a traveler when the when you have a puff, you would pull your boom vang on, which locks the uh, height of your boom, so it cannot go up anymore. So then you start easing your main sheet, and the and the main um, the boom just starts going out, but it doesn't go up. So it's almost like just like a traveler. So you, you would do it in a laser. If anyone sailed lasers before, you do a lot of vang sheeting. Basically, when you're overpowered, but you want to like have a big puff and spill it, you'd pull your boom vang on, you would ease your main sheet, and that would spill the wind. As soon as uh, that puff went by, you'd pull your main sheet back in. And with the boom vang on, as I said, it won't, uh, when you ease your main sheet, the boom won't go up. Out haul, I like, I like the word cranked. Uh, yeah. Like when someone says crank the out haul, you've probably heard that on a on a sailboat or crank the halyard. So that's really pull it on. Unless you're in very heavy sea state, uh, which Annapolis is fairly flat, I would recommend, you know, tensioning that out haul to help depower the boat. Uh, backstay, you know, you're going to start adding backstay in 15 plus. How much? It depends on the boat. It depends on the sea state. Um, depends on setup. But, you know, your backstay is going to be on how much that would be dependent on, on the boat that you're sailing uh, and the sea state. So traveler, so now we're going to start probably e easing the traveler uh, to leeward as boat heel angle increases past optimal. So if you do have a traveler on your boat, you're, you're playing that traveler and trying to keep a constant angle heel. Anyone in the room that went to North U, constant angle heel is something you hear very often. It's, it's a very fast way to get your boat upwind. Um, and the foils just work a lot better. And by foils, I mean um keel and rudder or centerboard or rudder depending on dagger board or rudder depending on what type of boat you're sailing so you're constantly easing that traveler to leeward as angle increases past optimal and then you know are you vang sheeting or are you adding twists so sometimes you could actually to depower you could pull your traveler all the way up similar to a light wind setting and ease your main sheet out and then pull your boom vang on and you'd be you'd be vang sheeting but you'd have tons of twist or another way you could just be using your traveler and dropping the um dropping the traveler to to spill the air as i talked about so it really depends on what controls you have on your sailboat and then what kind of works for that type of sailboat and sail plan uh, so there's a couple different options to help spill the air uh when you do have puffs and big air but in, in general you, you know everything's kind of on you're pulling your sail you're pulling your four sail controls on and your travelers help keeping the angle heel so mainsail trim downwind, this is one of my favorites. Um, a lot of mainsail trimmers love going upwind and as soon as they turn downwind, they start <laughs> telling you the shapes of the clouds in the sky and uh, they think their job's done. Uh, but, you know, a good mainsail, especially, you know, on a, on a rainbow or, or a lot of boats is the largest sail on the boat. So they've got you upwind, they've got to help you get yourself, get you guys back downwind. Um, so 
you really want to let the sail out to the proper apparent angle. So depending on the boat you sail, if you are sailing boats that sail really well dead downwind or, or um, as you'll see later in some videos, um, you do wing on wing, you're going to want that mainsail all the way out, okay? Because the wind is directly be directly behind you. If you're if you're sailing a boat like a, like a J70, a J80, you're probably going to have that mainsail in a little bit, especially when you sail hotter angles, because that's just the parent wind angle is that for much further forward. When jiving, make sure all the battens flip to the proper side. I've seen so many times people sailing downwind, especially with full battens on mainsails that need a little bit of help popping from side to side. A lot of that time, that's in lighter air. Uh, make sure when you complete your jive that you look up the mainsail and make sure that the battens are popped. Um, you're going to be easing all controls, okay? So when you get around to Mark, uh, Boom Bang, Cunningham, Outhaul, you know, that that's your that's that's what you want to be looking at and easing. Um, Another thing I've seen it a lot, uh, a lot of the time on larger boats, not so much, you know, rainbows uh, or the tartan, but people actually sit on the boom or they'll lean against it and lean down on it. A lot of the time, and especially in Annapolis in lighter air, you want that boom to be lift kind of up. So you want your boom bang off and you want a little bit of twist to get the sail going. As soon as someone sits on the boom, it's almost like adding boom bang, which is usually not very fast and down and downwind. So it, it's really comfortable, looks really cool but you're really doing your team, um, you know, a, not, not a favor by sitting on it. Um, so, you know, instead of using someone near, near the, you know, the mask guy or whatever, as, as the boom vang, actually use the boom vang as, as leech tension, don't just sit on it. So if you do start getting in that medium air and it's the same type of thing, you're looking for that top telltale to be flying 50% of the time. If you feel like it's flying hundred percent of the time, you can power the sail up. You can add a little boom vang. Okay. So, so that will help pull the leech down, take the twist out and power the sail up. So now we're gonna get into Genoa and jib trim lead position, okay? So how do you find if your lead is in the right spot, okay? So one thing that you always need to do when you go out on a boat is to see if your lead on the jib is in the right spot and how you do that and how I do it is I'll get, I'll get on a boat and I'll get the skipper to sail on a close hold course I'll get them to sheet the Genoa or the jib all the way in. And once they do that, I'll get them to go up into close hold, past close hold, close into irons, get the front of the sail to break. That will allow me to determine where that car is, if it's in the right position or if I need it forward, move it forward or move it aft. If the telltales or the ticklers, sorry, the ones on the front edge of the sail break simultaneously, that means your car is in the right position, okay? If your lead, or sorry, if the telltales break up top first, so if you have the top of the sail breaks first, you're going to want to move that car forward. And if the telltales break down bottom first, you want to move the car aft. And, and basically the way that I've always remembered this, and I wrote that up there, is bottom back. So if the go up, pull your sail and go in a close hall, go up, Pass close hold, let the sail break. And if it breaks in the middle, you're happy. If it breaks in the bottom, you move it back. And then you can figure out what, what breaks up top, it goes forward. So bottom back, BB. Uh, draft and halyard tension in a head sail, you're roughly around 30, 35 to 50%. And just depending on what type of driver and what type of sea state you're in, you can kind of adjust that draft to have different effects on how your boat sails. So Move the draft forward when you need a wider groove, such as in chop, so in CC, or an inexperienced helmsman. So you can see over here on the far right, halyard's effect on entry angle image. Increased halyard tension produces fuller entry angle, so that'd be more halyard tension, which is more forgiving, okay? An unsteady helm is less apt to, the, to, to stall the sail, okay? So the sail is much more forgiving if you have the knuckle really far forward around 30, 35%. If you are really flat water and you, you know, you have someone that sailed the boat for a long time, you can actually move the draft out. So you're not as worried about how your tension, say if you have a new sail and you're going to be able to point a little higher, but your sailing groove is going to be much smaller. So you're going to have to be very, um, very good at driving or keeping the boat in the sailing groove. Okay. Um, Telltale. So, Telltales are usually you have a telltale window. So there's little walls that are on the sail. Ticklers, they should always flow aft. Okay. They hang limp. That means the sail is stalled on the windward side or the leeward side. The trimmer should ease the sail immediately. Okay. To reattach flow, or the driver should head up. Okay. Or that's on the leeward side, or if the weather side um, telltale 
drops, that probably means you're either uh, you're too tight with your head tail, so you want to ease it, or you want to bear off. Okay, you're you're pointing too high. All right, so that's some information on Genoa and jib lead position. Um, so I don't think you guys have these on the rainbows, but they are out there, and they're probably going to be more. You're going to see them more and more on boats, and what they're called is in haulers. Um, basically on non-overlapping jibs, you can you can see here there's this blue line that's you see the sheet is running through the, the block up to the up through sort of like a some sort of circle ring kind of and then it goes to the clue of the sail and basically that pulls the jib of the sail in closer to the middle of the boat that gives you a better sheeting angle in light air as well as it allows you to twist the sail off so in light air you would pull the 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 lee or the in hauler in and you would actually ease your jib sheet a little bit and it would help open up the top of the sail and just make the sail look a little better um you're always looking at the top telltale so on jibs about 75 percent of the way up and if it has a batten it's usually right off the top batten just like a mainsail you don't want to make sure you're looking at that top leech telltale and those leech telltales on a jib, when we're talking about the mainsail, you want roughly 50. You know, you get away with a little less if you're really good at trimming. On a jib, you want about 90% stall um, flying relative to stall. So you want 90% flying, 10% stall. So when I set up for a jib, I'll pull the jib all the way in. I'll stall that top telltale. And then I'll burp it or ease it a little bit until that top telltale flies. And then that's usually a, a pretty good setting for, for my current conditions. Uh, if you do have an inhaler, medium air, you start easing the inhaler, okay? And then you can start tensioning. It's almost like a traveler for a mainsail. You ease it, you pull your sheet on, you start powering up the sail, take the twist out, close that leech, power that leech up. And then in heavy air, a lot of the time, you just ease the inhaler right off and you'd just be going right to the block. Um, and then you'd be getting a nice flat foot and you don't need much twist. One thing is a lot of the time people will be adjusting inhalers, but they never adjust the lead. Uh, make sure you are adjusting the lead um, when you are adjusting your inhaler, depending on you know the the sea state and the the shape that you're looking for in your jib. So Genoa and jib trim when tacking. Um, so I think this is really important. Um, I think in in jibs you can really get away with um, keeping the sheet in a little longer and then kind of snapping it across. But if you have an overlapping Genoa, something that I've seen a lot is is them holding onto it to the very last minute and actually letting the sail rake across the head sail, uh, the, the, the mass and the shrouds. And then it, the clue flying way out onto the new leeward side and the, the trimmer's taking a while to bring it in. Um, soon as the driver starts going to weather, you should ease that Genoa. The, the, the mainsail pulls the boat up and the Genoa pulls the boat down and the combination of the two makes you move forward as well as the flow and the keel. So if you, the driver is trying to go up past close hauled, having the Genoa is only going to be fighting him. So you actually could start easing it. That helps get the clue out and start starting the tack early. And it, you should be able to get the new sheet on a little bit earlier without the, all that load, the way that I previously spoke about a little bit easier, get the sheet in, get the, get the trim. So on Genoa's, I always, you know, I see a lot of people hold them a little too, too long. Try experimenting with easing a little bit earlier and getting it set up on the new side a little bit more efficiently and then get that new tack going. Uh, do not over trim on the new tack. A lot of the people will trim the sail to 100% as soon as they come out of the tack. Your apparent wind is slowed down. That means your apparent wind is further aft. You're not coming out of the tack at the same angle that you went in. So you're actually going to have a little bit of an ease. You can have a little bit of ease on your mainsail, but all big time, you're not going to be strapped right in. I would say you'd probably want to get out of the tack at about 85% Genoa or jib trim. And then kind of continue as the boat speeds up to 90, 95. Let the boat really get to you know not haul like get up to a to a certain number that the boat really starts feeling like it's moving and then go to proper sail trim and have the driver or 100 jib or genoa trim and have the driver come up at that time okay another um another thing is make sure your inhaler and leads are in, on the same on both tacks okay so always i've had a lot of times we go and do that experiment and and figure out where you want your jib lead on one side and everyone forgets on the on the starboard side so just make sure that they're on the same location and then if your team decides for whatever reason you want one jib lead a car forward you know maybe because you have a bigger chop on that tack or something you can do that but just start the day out make sure they're both in the same location um jib make sure the telltale is flying 90 percent of the time and not stalling very often okay uh we spoke about that the jib telltale 
uh, should be about 75, 80% of the way up the sail. Make sure it's flying about 90% of the time. If it's not, not flying 90% of the time, use that jib sheet because you are stalling the sail. So into spinnaker trim, exciting. So um, light, I'm going to go through symmetrical and asymmetrical. Um, I know that uh, the rainbows don't use them. Uh, the tartan has an asymmetrical, I'm pretty sure, but I am going to go over symmetrical. Symmetrical is a traditional way. Um, asymmetricals are much easier to use, but also can be much challenging, much more challenging to use. Um, so symmetrical pole, a symmetrical, you're going to want your pole forward. So on a symmetrical um, kite, there's always a pole that's attached from roughly, I don't know, five, four or five feet, depending on the size of the boat, up on the front edge of the mast. Pole's clipped onto the mast and is out onto uh, the tack of the sail. So usually in symmetricals, you're going to be sailing slightly higher angles. You're not going to be going directly downwind. So you're going to want that pole forward, okay? Um, clues, so that on, on a symmetrical sail, there's both the, there's the tack and the clue, but we just kind of call them clues. There's two bottom corners, and they kind of, you want them roughly at the same height. So you're going to be adjusting with symmetricals. There's usually something called a toppy lift um, or a, a, a pull up. Um, and uh, what it is, is it allows the pole to go up and down. It's a line that comes out of the mast and is attached to that pole. You can pull that up or down to, to help match the two clues of the kite. Okay. Asymmetrical, very easy. This is an asymmetrical sail over here. I think this is like a J111. So it's just one, one corner of the sail is always attached to the front end of the bowsprit. The other one has a working sheet and a lazy sheet. The working sheet is the one that you ease and pull in. Basically, you ease the sheet on a symmetrical sail until you see the front or asymmetrical sail until you see the front edge starting to curl. As soon as that front, front edge starts to curl, you pull that um, spinnaker sheet back in and you're constantly playing that. OK, light, slow adjustments in light air. OK, um, usually there's a tack line and a tack line is a line that's attached to the front edge of the sail. You can see in this picture, it's the blue corner that's attached to the black little pole. There's going to be a line that's attached there, and you can actually adjust the line. Um, you use that, you adjust the line for dousing, so you can get the sail in the boat and back out onto that sprit, as well as you can actually use it for a little bit of trimming tips, and I can kind of chat with you about that. Uh, do not oversheat the sail. So an asymmetrical sail, one of the easiest sails in light air to oversheet. And when you oversheat the sail, it looks great because it's not breaking, but you're not really using it to its maximum or optimal a design shape and what you need to do is constantly be easing the sail so that front edge of the sail the loft breaks and then pulling it back in oversheeted i've seen it a lot and it just the boat slows down and it's the sail looks okay but always make sure you're easing until you see a little bit of a curl okay also do not let collapse so if you're easing 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 make sure you're paying attention because if the curl starts starts and, it, and you're still easing and it starts getting through the middle of the sail it's going to collapse the sail and once you've collapsed an asymmetrical sail you really have to head up, kind of start the airflow again. So it's a real timely, costly uh, maneuver if you do let the sail collapse. So as I said, asymmetricals are fairly easy because you just have one line and you're pulling it in and out. Uh, but you do have to pay attention because uh, if it does collapse, you know, you've got to do a lot of maneuvering to get it going again, as well as if it's if you oversheet it, it kind of looks nice, but the boat isn't going fast. So that's spinnaker trim in light air. We've got spinnaker trim in medium air. So uh, symmetrical, you're going to start pulling the pole back, okay? So uh, the wind's going to start coming behind you. So you're going to start bringing that pole back. Trimmer, you're going to start talking to the driver about pressure, okay? So the trimmer, when he says the kite is light or there's not my, much pressure in the sail, the driver's going to tend to see have come up to try to get that pressure back in the kite and get the boat moving. At the same time, if the trimmer says there's lots of pressure in my kite and there's a puff in the kite, you can probably use that to bear off and take that as a VMG. Okay. Make sure the pole is as horizontal as possible. So I was talking about the topping lift, and that will let the pole go up and down. Sometimes boats will actually have either two rings on the mast to go from an upper to a lower ring, or they'll actually have a mast track where the butt end of the pole that's on the mast can go up and down. You can slide it just like a car on um, like a car on your, on your, for your Genoa. So you want that um, symmetrical pole as, as horizontal as possible. And that's all about projection. Okay. So you want the clues at the same height. As soon as you get the tip of the pole at the same height, the, to the clue and the tip of the pole at, if you can not adjust the butt, you would move the butt up so you're that the poles is horizontal. You're getting that sail as far away from the boat as possible. 
Um, it's all about projection. So yeah, that, that's my comment there. That's it's all about projection. So asymmetrical, you can see over here, I think that's like a J105, looks like a San Francisco uh, Golden Gate Bridge in the background there that looks like San Francisco conditions. So, you know, they're probably in that medium air, you know, 10 to 15 knots. And, and they've, you know, they've really started being able to sail downwind. And something you can do if you really want to get a little bit deeper in those medium air conditions is you can ease your tack line. You can see here the tack line's up about a foot. And what that does is it gives your sail a longer left lane. And it allows the sail to rotate in front of your boat similar to a symmetrical sail. So you can actually sail a little bit lower. Sea state, you know, this is probably, you know, this sea state here is probably on the edge. It's probably a pretty good team. But when you start easing your tack line, if the sea state's a little messy, the, the kite has a tendency to move around a lot. So it's kind of a tight balance between easing tack line. You usually don't want to ease your tack line much more than 8 to 12 inches, depending on the boat. Uh, but if you do want to get a little bit further down for a tactical reason, or you think um, you wanted to just bear off a little bit, uh, you can ease that tack line. That will help change the shape of the sail and help you sail a little bit lower. Uh, again, Trimmer's talking to driver about pressure. So we talked about that, you know, and so, you know, the, the tactician is telling what lane they want to be in. The driver is driving the lane. And then the trimmer is really telling uh, the driver to go up or down, probably two or three degrees, depending on how much tension or load is in the kite sheets. Okay. Um, getting into heavy air. So this, this is the, always the fun time. Um, so heavy air symmetrical. So your pole's back now on a symmetrical, you know, the wind's right behind you. You're probably sailing dead downwind. Sometimes on symmetrical boats, you know, they get kind of get that little wibbly wobbly movements on the downwinds. Uh, that's, that's when, you know, you're in heavy air and got a symmetrical kite downhaul on hard. So is the, is the same thing. There's an uphaul or topping lift, something in, in, in heavy air, the kite's going to want to pull up. A lot of the time you'll need a line from the bottom of your pole down to the deck, and that will help keep the pole from going up because the kite just wants to go to the sky. Um, tweakers. So tweakers are something that are attached to your spinnaker sheets. If you do have tweakers on a boat, you want to pull them down, and that helps flatten the leeches of the sail so the sail's not as powerful. Um, and then usually uh, on smaller uh, boats that use symmetrical kites, You'd actually have the trimmer doing the guy and the sheet because you're using both sides, the one with the pole and the one that's without the pole and just the sheet. Uh, once you're into heavy air, and I would recommend a lot of the time in medium air switching so that there's one person in the guy, one person on the sheet. So that because the loads get quite a bit more and, and you just want to make sure that the kite's being trimmed properly. Uh, asymmetrical. Okay, if you put your tack line back up, as soon as the wind picks up like this, tack line back down. If you do start you know, sailing really fast, the, the sail will have a tendency to go over the, left, the leeward side of your boat. Uh, if your boat starts healing past the optimal angle and you start getting cavitation on your rudder, that's usually when bubbles start coming up and you wipe out um, the back edge of your rudder, um, just ease the sheet. So as soon as you start feeling that boat kind of starting to round up, just ease that spinnaker sheet and that will unload the, the pressure on the kite. And uh, that should be able to help keep you back on your feet. Uh, out to outsider blow through jibe. So if you raise Mel just 24s, there's a type of jibe called the blow through jibe. I wouldn't recommend it to anyone that's that's not on a high performance boat that's a, with a team that's practicing regularly. So on an asymmetrical, you can do inside jibe. So that that means the the lazy sheet or the non working sheet is is through the between the forestay and the sail itself. In heavier airs or ocean racing, you usually do outside jibes, and that just means the the lazy sheet, instead of running towards the force, it actually runs around the outside of the sail and all the way back down to the windward side. So when you jibe, the sail actually, instead of inverting between the force stay and actually being a little tricky, it actually flaps around like a flag and then you just pull it in on the new side. Okay, so I'd recommend outside jibes for, for most uh, scenarios. And one thing with outside jibes is you always, as soon as you ease your, your old working sheet, so your new lazy sheet and you're pulling on your new one, since the, the line or the sheet goes all the way around your boat, make sure you keep decent tension on it. You know, not enough for the sail to stop moving, but not enough for it to fall down in front of your boat because the lazy sheet on outside jibes can fall down and end up underneath the, the hull. Um, if you're in planing conditions like this, you're going to want to start moving the weight aft. Um, 
Um, we had planning conditions on that Annapolis regatta the the Wednesday before the regatta, and we we a couple of us got the kites up, and it was a lot of fun, and we moved everyone to the back of the boat, and basically that just helps move uh, get the the bow of the boat out of the water, less wetted surface, and and really helps with the boat's uh, movement. Um, always have one crew member uh, designated to the boom vang. Okay, so as we talked about, the leech powers the boat up. So if you do wipe out, whether you're in a symmetrical or asymmetrical, your mainsail is, is still a very big sail and you're gonna to wanna to make sure your boom vang comes off so that the, the, the leech opens up and spills as much air as possible. So you can try to stay up on your feet, okay? Um, here's a cool little video of some planing. Uh, this is, uh, let's get this video, we'll play, there we go. So this, this is Bombarda, this is a Melgis 24 team. So this is down in Miami, we we're doing some videos and uh, just kind of doing some tuning and stuff. And this, I just thought this was a pretty cool video. If you ever get up on the step like that, it's it's quite a neat feeling. And, you know, right now, you know, the boat looks like it's going fast, but not that fast. You know, you're like, I could probably ride my bike quicker than that. Um, but when you're on a boat moving that fast, you've probably been on a boat moving, you know, I'm not sure, but eight to 10 knots and things are moving when you're moving you know, 16 to 20 knots, you know, the boat feels like it's flying. It's it's a pretty cool feeling. Um, so, just kind of get on to the next slide here. Just gonna do this. Okay, so we have, um, we had, so now I'm going to talk about trimming sails for sea state. So I've kind of been referencing it throughout, but you do in theory in flat water, you can have flatter sails, choppy water. You probably want fuller sails. The picture on the right is not a real image of a J160 or water, just FYI. Um, but that would be some pretty, pretty crazy sea state to be trimming in. I'd probably be looking uh, for shore or a nice safe anchorage if I was in those conditions. Um, but uh, so flat water sails should be flat, as I said. How do we do this? The draft can be moved aft or have finer entry points in the head sail. So remember we talked, you don't need as much in, in, in flatter water. You can actually keep the draft further aft and have a flat entry. Sails can be less forgiving, but you're in flatter water. So a lot of the time you can get away with it, okay? In choppy water or big seas, sails need depth. You're going to be easing your outhaul. You might move your car lead one further forward to have a further bigger, uh, rounder foot in your head sail. Um, you're not going to want it as flat, so you can make sure you can power through the sea state. Move in, in, in choppy water on your head sail. Move that draft really far, far forward. So put on a lot of halyard, get that draft around 30%, and that will give you a large driving groove so you can get through those. It's, it's going to going to help you be more forgiving when you're driving okay it'll help keep you in the groove uh so trimming sails for sea state is is very important um reaching so you know we've talked about upwind we've talked about downwind um reaching is something that we do do sometimes if you're doing point to point races sometimes on a wednesday night or thursday night or whenever you guys do your racing the wind changes and the marks are still in the same spot and you need to start reaching so i wanted to chat about that and mainsail again it's kind of like when I was talking about the asymmetrical sail, very easy to over trim a mainsail when you're reaching because it looks great. Okay, so what you want to do is let it out. Okay, don't set and forget. Okay, when in doubt, let it out. Okay, so you can ease it until you see to the front edge of the mainsail is starting to off and then you can pull it in. So making sure you're adjusting your mainsail to the proper parent angle that you're sailing or the proper reaching angle that you're sailing. Uh, now that you've eased your main sheet because you're reaching, What's happened is your boom's gone up and you've actually lost all the tension you had when you were sailing upwind on the leech. So how you control the leech tension when you're easing your main sheet to, to go on a reach is by your boom vang. So as soon as you start easing that, that main sheet, if you think you're in medium air and you could use a little bit more oomph, you'd actually pull your boom vang on, tension that leech, and that will help power you up. Okay, head sail. Um, you can try to sheet outboard. So if you're ever on a reach, uh, having the jib go through the jib leads inboard usually doesn't help because it actually, there's a lot of twists. So as soon as you ease the, the jib sheet, the sail or Genoa sheet, the sail is going to step away from the boat. You're going to kind of lose the power. So what you do is actually 
sheet the sail to the outboard lead um, or or uh, the tow rail or sometimes and I'll show you guys some videos we'll actually have some some of the sailors that you know using themselves as outboard leads on a sailboat um snatch block or outboard lead so a snatch block is one of those blocks if you're on a sailboat and you're reaching they, they open and close so they're very easy to attach and detach because you never you don't need a bunch of blocks on the side of your boat all the time they're for specialty reaching occasions. And those blocks are very easy to attach and, and put on your sheet and take off your sheet. Um, spinnaker, you know, you're, you can use a spinnaker when you're reaching, but one thing that I would recommend, like sometimes people will use their spinnaker when it's not necessary. Um, and just make sure that you're, you're sailing to VMG. So if it's, the spinnaker is taking you really fast, but you're not really going anywhere. You're just reaching back and forth. You're not getting to your destination, getting to your next mark. Spinnaker is probably not the best option. You're probably going to want to take down your spinnaker and use your jib to get to that location. Or, or same with the other part. If you're sailing with your jib and you're reaching around, you really need to get a little bit further down. You put your kite up. So just make your make sure you're using the proper sail for the reaching angle that you're doing. Okay. Quickly touch on this. I know a lot of people. Uh, I know like the rainbows don't have one. It might be a good idea if you guys are doing distance racing to maybe get one for the tartan if you don't already have one. But a Code Zero is a specialty reaching sail, um, so it's kind of a hybrid between a Genoa and a Spinnaker that's really good at reaching. Um, just some you can see it here. I think this is a I don't know J one eleven maybe. Um, so you see it flies off the bowsprit, but it can sail really high apparent wind angle, so it can't sail. Um, like close haul, but it can sail 45 degrees apparent, 50 degrees apparent very easily. And it can also, and heavier wind strength, sail, you know, as low as 90 very efficiently. Um, so a, little, a couple things on a, what's considered an A0. Um, power tension is separate from the, um, luff tension is separate from the power tension. So it's usually on a cable. So we actually have uh, the cable gets tensioned by the halyard. And then you actually adjust the luff of the sail uh, just by attaching two lashings on the head of the tack to the thimbles on the cable. Um, it's a little bit different than a Genoa. A lot of the time at high angles, say that 45 uh, parent, uh, parent wind angle, uh, the front of the sail can almost be bubbling almost 45% of the time. And it actually works almost just as efficient. So you can sail these really high angles in a little untraditional method. Like if anyone ever was sailing up wind and they had their Genoa luffing 25% of the time, I'm pretty sure I'd be be screaming um but on a on a code zero that's that's just something you have so much more sail working and you're trying to sail that higher angle you can actually get away with it um higher angles on a on a code zero or an a zero um the leech will usually flog you can either let it flog because it basically is just not supported back there uh, and a lot of them have a little bit more mid girth than you would want for that type of sail angle um or you can pull the leech line on and it actually kind of puts a hook in the back of this sail so it's I don't know. It's, it's either one. I've, I've talked to a lot of experts and, and one person likes to just let it flog and the other person likes to pull the leech line on so the sail doesn't break down, but he has a big hook in his leech. So um, those are kind of things that you would see on a Code Zero specialty reaching sail. Um, so th those were sail trim talk. This is, as I said, this was all recorded. We kind of went through a lot there. So I will send this link off so anyone can go back if I was if I was talking a little quickly, uh, or if you didn't get something, or if you just wanted to take some notes down um, for the next time you went on sailing, feel free. I'll get this. Uh, I think it'll be a YouTube link. You can, uh, you can use it to reference all this stuff. Um, so something, especially like a sailing um, school, like you guys, I think sail care is something that's very important. Um, sales last a long time. Um, the material lasts a long time. A lot of the time, the shape is the first thing to start going, but the material lasts a lot, lot longer than the actual design shape. Um, I know um, if anyone, if the two gentlemen were there that we were sailing with last couple of weeks ago in Austin, the boat to J-World did not have the same, you know, quality level of sails that the that the competitors, that the competitors did and the, the rest of the fleet because we were sailing in the J-80 fleet. And uh, a lot of the private owners had nice new sails and we had a bit older sails and and, you know, these sales were not only aged, but some of them probably weren't taken care of the best. So, you know, taking care of a sale will really help the longevity of the sale, not just the sale itself and not falling apart, but actually the design and the depth of the sale and the, the where the draft is and, and keeping care of them and making sure that they're, they're going to last you. Um, so things that break down a sale, obviously usage, anything that's dynamic, you use it, it moves, it's going to break down. Okay. Second biggest thing, UV. So that's why we have you know, jib socks on those J80s we're using, 
you have a UV cover on your jib if you do have a furler, um, or you know, and you have a sail cover for your mainsail, and you put that on religiously. Okay, the biggest thing, and I'll show you a picture after this, is people forgetting how much UV exposure ruins sails. It's it's other than usage and and using it all the time, UV is the first thing that kills it. And a lot of the time, at the end of a sail's life, it just saw too much sun. Okay, with proper servicing. Uh, flogging or fluttering. So the third thing is when a sail starts flogging or fluttering, or if you have your new new like um, spinnaker go up and they're like, oh, that sounds like money because it's all <laughs> crinkly. Um, that's basically the sail when it when it when it starts moving and it's fluttering or 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 flogging, it's going to be breaking down and basically it's just moving more than it than it than it needs to. Um, there's foot and leech lines on mainsails and jibs. And a lot of the time in medium to heavier air and sometimes in lighter air with older sails and certain sheet tensions, you'll start hearing either the foot of the leech start to flap. What you wanna do is just snug the leech line or the foot line in a little bit. And uh, that basically would just wanted to snug it enough to stop the flapping. Something you try to remember after a day of sailing that you have tension uh, your leech lines you want to, or your foot lines, you want to let them off. Okay. You don't need that tension in the leech or the foot of the sail after the day of sailing. You just need it in there to help support the sail and not let it flutter and kind of break, break down. Improper use. So if you have a jib that's made for three knots and you're out there in a hurricane, um, it's probably not going to last. Um, if, you know, if you have a mainsail and you're not reefing it properly and you're pulling on different ways or, or things, you know, you can break sales or break down sales with improper use. Uh, improper storage methods. So, you know, taking a sail down on a really rainy day in uh, October and pulling your boat and sticking it downstairs for the winter without any sort of dehumidifier or something, that'd be improper storage, okay? Making sure the sail is dry, making sure it's in a location that's probably uh, temperature regulated, um, as well as, um, you know, somewhere where there's not sun, okay? Another thing that breaks down sails, and this is chafe. So you can see here in the picture, you can see that there's actually stanchion patches. We usually put spreader patches on sails. Some of the bigger boats will put radar patches. Um, and these are just basically where hard points of the sail hit parts of the boat. And we just put reinforcing there because that's where chafe starts happening. Sometimes, depending on where a line is, uh, depending on how a sail sits on a boom, sometimes you'll get chafe uh, on the sail itself. A lot of the time, uh, you want to keep an eye on that. Okay, so chafe will break down. Not using leech line and foot line. So we talked about that. So if you do have that fluttering noise, yeah, uh, if you hear fluttering and you look and there's no helicopter in the sky, it's probably your sail. Um, pull that leech or foot line on. Okay, it will it will help save. What happens is actually so the leech tape is folded over the back edge and same with the foot. It will actually start to create a hinge when it's flapping like that, and it'll actually start breaking down right in the edge of the leech tape. Okay, so it's. It, it does quite a bit of damage to your sail. It's not going to happen in like a minute or two, but if you go out for an eight hour day of sailing and you're a leech clogs, I can guarantee you it's, it's, it's probably going to start ripping off the back edge of the sail. Um, not having them serviced. So the biggest thing is not bringing a sail in when you think you have something breaking down on it. It's like, you know, a car. It's like, oh no, my car stopped working. I got to bring it in. You bring your car in for oil changes every whatever. Um, 5,000 kilometers. I'm Canadian, so probably whatever, 3,000 3, miles or whatever, whatever your car does. The same thing, kind of thing, especially for a sailing school. You know, we have, we have a lot of sailing schools in Vancouver and they bring their sails in religiously just for checkover and getting a professional's eye on the sails before they start breaking down or before you start, the sail starts having serious damage. It can not only prevent a sail breaking upon being able to be fixed again, but it also keeps you know, the sailors on the water more. So if you have a sail go down and you don't have another sail to replace it, you know, that's boats out of commission for the day. But if you did, you know, you did your winter servicing on the sails, chances are that the sails are going to be ready for a full season. Um, so that that's kind of sail care and repair. I think it's pretty important, especially in a sailing school. You know, you guys obviously run on a budget. So if you do put that extra time into making sure the sails are well taken care of, um, you know, you guys will be spending less money on sales or possibly be able to buy, you know, nicer sales uh, for the for the same because you're not you're not going to be turning them over as often. OK, you might have a little bit larger of a budget. Uh, sale repair kit. I think this is pretty important. Um, you know, I know the rainbows. Probably their, their sales are Dacron. So, you know, they're, they're probably um, 
they're, they're, it's some of the toughest material. But at the same time, having a little sail repair kit, just in case you know, you're out there for the day and you just have a small tear or a little rip, and you can kind of fix it on the water and then get the sail into a sail off once you get off the water, but it doesn't have to ruin your day of sailing. And something that you would need, you know, wax thread, uh, needles, a palm, uh, sticky back sail repair material, spinnaker repair tape, and shears. For the, um, if you guys are just day sailing, you know, probably sticky back sail repair material. So just some, it's basically like sailing stickers that, that are made for reinforcement. So you just stick it down or like a, almost, almost like a bandaid and uh, except the whole part sticky. And then you would put on both sides, spinnaker repair tape. It's the same stuff, but lighter made of spinnaker material. Uh, and then a set of shears or scissors to make sure that you can cut the material. A lot of the time, the material is a little um, tougher, the sticky back repair material. So you usually use it, need a good set of scissors to make sure you cut through it properly. Wax thread, needles, and palm. That might be a little bit more for something like Molly does. She does some you know, stuff in her catamaran and uh, she's offshore. And if there was a big rip in her mainsail, she may need to drop it and, and maybe hand sew some of the sail back together. Um, so a sail repair kit, very important. And I think it just keeps people on the water and you can do small repairs. Another advantage of doing a small repair, sometimes you have a small, small damage and you're like, oh, I just want to do that last race. If you don't have the repair material, you're probably going to do that last race. If you do have the repair material, you're probably going to throw the repair material on, do the last race. And there's not a chance that that small repair or small damage is going to turn into a bigger damage. Okay. Uh, so this is a mainsail picture I took of a gentleman. He was just hoisting his mainsail and his mainsail split in half. He left his mainsail out on, so you can see almost CAN there. He left his mainsail without a mainsail cover on for three months. Mainsail was brand new. It was toast. So always use your sail cover. This took three months in the summer in Vancouver, split left to leach. Uh, make sure, and he wanted warranty. He said that and he never left his sail cover on. So uh, we, we, had a, we had a conversation, but um, always use your sail cover. Make sure your UV cover on the head sail is still working. So another thing is you sails that you furl up They'll have UV covers or they'll have a sock that goes over top of them after they're furled and be hoisted with the spinning collar. Just make sure that they're still functioning um, and that the stitching's proper in them. Once those get burned out, it's going to start breaking down your sail. Uh, we see a lot of sails with bad UV damage and, and neglect. So leaving sails out, no matter how long of a period of time it is, it's going to be breaking down your sail. I can't uh, emphasize how important that is. Um, so uh, my next slide here is just chatting about the North U Performance Race Clinics. I'm sure uh, Jamie, Molly, Megan, Lisa, and the gentleman they sailed with last week have talked about it. You guys might have even seen us over at the club uh, a few weeks ago. But I just quickly want to go over and actually have a couple of fun videos I took on board down in St. Thomas. I hope Jamie, Molly, Megan, and Lisa aren't... Uh, are worried about the uh, videos. They're, they're great little videos. And it kind of shows how much fun we have down there and how awesome and uh, and maybe intense the learning situation is. And, and we went down there and had a blast. Um, so it's one design sailing. Uh, we do these clinics all around North America. St. Thomas is usually the most popular one due to the, due to the weather uh, in terms of the wind and the sun and the temperature. Uh, this year we had a lot of wind, uh, which was pretty exciting, uh, but I think it gave our team an idea like by the end of the week we were sailing in 25 knots and it was like another day on the water um so it was pretty cool that way you get five days on the water with a professional coach okay it's usually two water sessions a day um and uh so you're doing 10 three-hour water sessions uh, so you're on the water quite a bit over those five days uh you got world-class coaching so you do have a professional coach on your boat with your team all day long as well as a coach on the water in a coach boat. Okay. And some of the, you know, these coaches are world champions, uh, North American champions, actively racing in the top end of the fleets, you know, uh, today. So um, off water video debriefs with drone footage. So this is something that's been pretty cool. We were actually chatting about this, about how Bill used to get drone footage or footage from up top. And uh, Bill Gladstone actually used to hoist himself up a mast. He'd have a, have a have a sailboat out there and he'd go up in a bosun chair and sit at the top of the mast beside the start line and take video now he leaves his bosun's chair at home and he brings a drone um so we get these really cool drone footage videos of not only starts the mark roundings the windward legs 
and we actually debrief them and break them down after racing when everyone kind of gets involved everyone's kind of crowded around um crowded around the, the the tv monitor maybe with a beer in the hand a cocktail in the hand after sailing and kind of chitter chatting about what they saw in the course and you get a really cool bird's eye view of what you actually look like out there um you get 30 plus starts so we do this thing where we do like before a race you, on, on practice races, we'll do two to three starts at a time. So we'll do like 15 minute rolling starts. So your starts, you know, you get 30 starts. There's no way you're leaving this place without being better at starting. Um, at the end of the event, we do a regatta day at the St. Thomas. If we in some of the, we did the regatta experience event last time. So you're actually involved in a real regatta, but in some point of any North U event, you're going to be doing a day, a full day of real competitive racing. And another thing I think that's really neat is that we actually switch the crew members up quite a bit. Some people come with a team that that just want a certain positions that are that are focusing on that. But I would say ninety five percent of the teams, uh, we actually rotate skip skipper, main sheet, jib trim, bow every single say every half an hour throughout the day, depending if it's a drill or if it's a race. The people are constantly moving, um, so that kind of brings a whole different aspect because you kind of learn a little bit of everything. Um, so that's kind of a breakdown of what you would expect out of a North U clinic. Um, I've got some pictures of our team here. Okay. So uh, this is us on the left. Actually, we do a round Island race, which is pretty fun. Um, and that was a picture of, of us on another boat heading down. I think we were surfing a wave there with Jamie Tiller in hand. Uh, that's a picture of us over on the right coming on in. Um and then I've actually been able to upload a couple videos of us. And you can see here, this is St. Thomas Yacht Club in the background there. And uh, let's see if we can get some audio. We're right in the mix here. So you can actually see. Uh, you can actually see Molly talking about the boats behind. So she's actually um, communicating what's going on behind because we're going downwind. So the the um, uh, the all the winds coming from behind you. So you need to be looking backwards. A lot of times you're sit, sitting on a boat, everyone's looking forward. So Molly's Molly's doing a good job there. Um, this is us coming up to a ley line. I think the biggest. The biggest thing I want to talk about here is like you can talk about how much communication is going on. We're racing against nine other boats. We're in fairly heavy weather, so people's voices got to be up. Uh, but this is us communicating about trying to get off, I think, on a port ley line here. And we've got Jamie kind of doing the tactician main sheet role. <laughs> So here's Megan. Oh, sorry, Molly. On driving, Jamie. Jamie talking about when Megan. Uh, you can see Megan there was was pulling down on that jib, and basically she was trying to get that top telltale to work really well. Good job. Um, and we got uh, holding the boom as well. Okay. So nice wind right in the middle of the fleet. So we're having a pretty good race that one. And uh, so you can see Jamie here. He's really, it was, it was tough to hold that jib down. And these guys were real, real competitors out there. Um, so you can see Jamie trying to wing on wing here. And Molly talking about the wind. So yeah, pretty beautiful weather down there, guys. Um, I highly recommend, uh, you know, getting involved uh, with that. And, and, you know, there's also uh, North U, Bill Gladstone does webinars like this, but they're a little bit, they're a little bit longer. They're probably four hours or so. And so North U has a whole array of products. Um, I find that these are the, the most fun um, I've had. And I think a lot of sailors are visual learners. So, you know, we could talk about all this, all we want all night about trim. But getting on the water and actually executing it, I think, is is where people have the biggest learning um, ability. Um, 
so yeah, I, I, I had a blast with Jamie, Molly, Megan, and Lisa, and we just really, you know, we went out to dinner. We were, we were on the boat for six or seven hours a day. We really became a team over the week. And I was lucky enough and I should have, should have worn my hat. I think I have it around here somewhere. Let me see if I can grab it, but they actually gave me a shirt and a hat um, for a little thank you. And we actually looked like a real full team on regatta day. So that was, that was really cool. I had a blast. So um, thanks guys for listening tonight. I really appreciate you coming out. I, I went through a lot, so I don't expect everyone to remember everything. Don't feel like uh, that was a little overwhelming or you can't bang everything off that I said in the last hour or so that we've been on. Don't worry about that. Um, we're, um, we're, we're, we're fine. This is recorded. You guys can look at this later. You, my contact information is right here. Okay. So it's just drew.mitchell at northsales.com. Anybody uh, with Annapolis Sailing School, please reach out to me. Um, I've actually got uh, Alexander. He also works at North Sales Vancouver. He does a lot of these here with me as well. Um, but you call the law, call my cell phone, send me an email, get a hold of me on social media. Uh, feel free to reach out, use me as a resource. Um, I had a lot of fun meeting everyone from Annapolis Sailing School uh, down in St. Thomas. I hope I meet more. And um, and yeah, let, let's let's kind of open it up for a couple, a little bit of uh, Q&A if people do have questions. Um, you could either chat in the chat box or uh, Jamie, if you wanted to turn the volume back on, people can people can ask questions. Feel free. I'm a, I'm in no rush. Hey Drew, thank you so much. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to do this and making this available for people. Uh, you won't be surprised that Molly already has a list of questions to ask you. <laughs> but um, I know we've got a few people who are not in the room here, so I'm going to give them a chance to ask questions first, and then we'll jump back here to the room here. So. If, uh, Dan or Bella or any of you have questions, go ahead and do that. Thanks, Jamie. If if your mic's not working or if you're not allowed to speak, just, just type into the chat box if you do have a question. If not, if not, we'll uh we'll just keep so moving on. Yeah, we'll start with a question and then uh, we'll let the rest of them jump in. Here, yeah, type a question if they have it. But here's Molly. Okay, Andrew, hey, Molly. thank you. Okay. That was spectacular. No problem. All right, so sailing an asymmetric spinnaker yep. in heavy air. Yep. You're on the helm and you start to broach. Yep. What are your steps to save it? Uh, you'd ask your spinnaker, you'd immediately ask your spinnaker trimmer and the person holding the boom vang to release both the sheet and the boom vang. And okay. that should unload everything. And that'll stand the boat back up. That should stand the boat back up. Yep. Yeah. Okay. If, so if the driver feeling, does nothing. The driver wouldn't turn down. You want to turn down. Yep. You do want to turn down. Don't do okay. a big movement because the big movement will start the cavitation early. You probably just want to start to pull it towards you um, to try to get that boat back down. Uh, but okay. yeah, driver, pull the tiller towards yourself and main or uh probably yeah main sheet boom vang and spinnaker sheet ease just just release everything and the boat should be able to to get back yeah. on the seat yeah when you said turn downwind do you mean you're already going downwind so what do you further downwind further so down like further, further down because a lot of the time you're probably 10 degrees off a of ddw on an asymmetrical and heavy okay. so you have you have some more degrees to come further down Okay, so back to the boom bang, which I'm not ever convinced I'm using correctly in a rainbow. Yep. Is it as simple as upwind, you want your bang on, downwind, you want your bang off, or is it also a function of wind speed? And wind. when ever down speed, do you want your sail to work like a barn door so you would crank on your bang? So you would want twist in your main sail. So you'd want your boom vang off in lighter air. So you'd want it off in lighter air going upwind. Okay. okay. And then as you want to start powering up the leech, so that top telltale is flying hundred percent of the time, you could pull your boom vang on. Okay. So medium air, you're probably a little bit of boom vang and it's what's happening is it's just tensioning or loosening the back edge of your sail. So if, if the, if the top telltale is not flying, there's a chance your boom bang is too tight. Okay. Um, 
A lot of the time, your, your main sheet does a lot of that tension in the lighter airs. And then once you get to medium airs, you can start using your boom bang to add a little bit more tension. Okay. Downwind in lighter airs, you want your boom bang off mostly, and that will help open up. And then if you feel like you that top telltale is, is flying too much downwind or on a reach, you would pull your pull your boom bang on. So in theory, or it, you know, sometimes it would be upwind, you'd want it slightly on and downwind, you'd want it off. But they're, you know, in lighter airs, you don't want any boom bang on upwind. You're doing most of your bang, bang tension or your leech tension with your main sheet. And then downwind in lighter airs, you'd probably want it off as well. So you're not pulling it too tight. I would say in 12 knots, you probably put your boom bang on fairly tight in medium air to really power up that leech, close the leech, take the twist out and barn door it and really have a nice flat sail to, to go downwind with. Hey Drew on that, is there times in sea state when it gets choppy that you want to be using the bang to add a little tension to keep the boom from bouncing around or is that not? Not so much, no. I wouldn't like, I would, I would, no, I, I wouldn't say so. Uh, you that uh, I would pull your main sheet on if you're going upwind maybe, or just have someone hold it. But the C state, one thing you would like, something a little, do you guys have adjustable backstays in the rainbows? No. Not in the rainbows, but in the tartan. The, the tartans, are, you know, on those Saturdays that are like really nice and light air where the power boaters love going out fishing and there's power boat wakes all over the place. We had one of those on, uh, on the Annapolis race I did. So when you come, if you're sailing downwind and you ever get hit by a big, big wake, the whole boat kind of shakes. And then think of like, if you've ever been on top of a mast, you're walking around the bottom of the boat, you can't feel it, but the guy on the top of the mast is like, please stop, you know? Um, you're, that's the same thing with the top of your mast when you get into those waves. So what you can do to actually counteract that is add a little backstay. Some, some little trick that I have is when I'm sailing in a boat, usually downwind, lighter airs, and a power boat comes by, when I'm calling for those that we're going to heat it up a little bit, try to get through the waves a little quicker, I'll snug in my backstay. Now, help, that'll help just keep the mast in column and tight, and it won't bounce around as much on you. And you should be, you should transfer the energy a little bit more efficiently, not lose everything. Little little trick. Power boat wakes in Annapolis are a huge issue. <laughs> yeah, I have one more if nobody else has any questions. Yep. Yeah, no, keep going. Just me again. Okay. So. The rainbows, our tartan has a Cunningham and I understand how to use it. The rainbows do not. Yep. So hypothetically, yep. if I were in a condition where I want my draft forward because I'm in high wave conditions, high chop, whatever, could yep. I actually rig a Cunningham through my reefing grommet? And yeah. Yep. <laughs> totally. You could. And you could also do just halyard adjustment, you know, like it's the exact same thing. The Cunningham pulls down doesn't pull up but as you've ever tried to adjust a halyard under load it's very difficult so the cunningham is just an easier way to make smaller fine-tune adjustments and then also ease them off because playing around with a halyard all the time is not very functional to get around a race course great all right we'll pause just really quickly you know brian uh rob any of you tim have questions you want to jump in with I have a question. Perfect. Bella. Um, my questions are not nearly as um, interesting as Molly's. Um, I'm unfamiliar with the term flogging. Can you explain oh, that? Yeah, when the sail flaps. Oh, okay. It's just another or, uh, another term for luffing? Luffing, yeah. Exactly. Okay, okay, but, thanks. Good thing, because I was thinking it meant something else, like on an old English uh, sea ship. Um, yeah, right. Perfect. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we cleared that up. <laughs> Uh, I thought Flogging Molly was a good Irish band, but um, <laughs> it certainly was. Uh, hey, Drew, we greatly, greatly appreciate having you do this for us. Uh, it was great having you down here for the North Youth Clinic and seeing you at the school. Um, you know, we are looking forward to getting people back down to St. Thomas next year. Uh, but if you're ever back in the area, let us know. And, uh, you know, if we ever get up your way, uh, we will definitely bomb in on you, but uh, I'll pause one last time for any last questions. <laughs>